Welcome to the Nutmeg Tavern. Come on in. Hey, I'm your host today, John Townsend, and we talk about fun 18th century stuff here on the live stream, usually having to do with, you know, things that we've done in the past uh, here on the channel, whether it's cooking or other things. We always have fun, and there's always great questions, and uh, hey, welcome, come in, have a seat, relax. Uh, I am joined on the other side of the time vortex on the console, Aaron. Hello, how's everyone doing? You Eric? good today, John? Yeah. You good today? Yeah, I'm good today. Okay. I am good today. It has been a busy week. It's been one that I have to do a lot of reflection. I had a special presentation I had to give, and it, it took a lot of my sort of uh, kind of look back energy. So I'm, you know, raring to go. I guess it's the end of the week, though, which is, hey, this is the best part of the week, isn't it? Friday, four o'clock. Okay, so today's topic. Hey, where's Ryan? Well, yeah, that's right. Usually Ryan's back here. Um, Ryan's, um, I don't know, what do we say? He's out. Ryan is out this week. He'll be back. Don't worry. He's he's busy relaxing, which is a good thing. Yeah. A very good thing. Oh, he might be driving right now. Well, he might be driving. Relaxing, driving. Yeah. He's supposed to be relaxing. If he's relaxing and driving, bad thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so today's topic. Um, it is the time of year when, um, in the 18th century, food preservation, food preservation techniques, it was really, really important. Uh, harvest time, fruits, vegetables, all of these things had to be preserved so that they would be available for the winter. We don't think about that much, do we? We go to the grocery store and we get whatever we want. We can get fresh fruit in the winter. And I mean, all these things are already preserved on the shelf for us. We've got rows and rows of canned whatever. These things are already preserved for us. We need to give not a second thought to it. Of course, in the 18th century, it's almost completely different. Everything is coming in fresh and they had to do their own preserving, especially this time of year. So I've got a couple of books I want to talk about and I'll read some pieces and we'll talk about food preservation. And this guy, this is like the most important one really, I think uh, that gives you some, not just recipes, but kind of ideas behind food preservation and what things were important. Uh, this is William Ellison, his Country Housewife's Family Companion. Um, he printed this in or uh, published this in 1749. So it's I mean, it's kind of early. It's right there in the middle of the 18th century. Um, he was a, a prolific author that did some pieces. I did a brewing book. He did this uh, one, which was kind of, you know, important. You know, even in the time period, he got a little flack for this book because he writes it from the point of view like, you know, maybe he's got all the answers or he's perfect and people would want to go see his model farm. And it wasn't it wasn't a model farm. Now, you can write a book about have, you know, the model farm without having a model farm because, I mean, you can't do everything, can you? It's hard to have a model farm and write a book about a model farm. <laughs> so this book is chock full of what it takes to run an efficient small farm in central southern England in the middle of the 18th century. And I that probably gives us a lot of clues about what's happening in North America at the same time. They're dealing with almost exactly the same kinds of issues. So it's really good for both England and North America in the time period. So what, what, do, what do we, when we think food preservation off the top of our heads, we think of preserves like, you know, making jellies and jams. Yeah, but there's like a dozen more methods and, and actually more important important methods in the time frame. Some of them we use today and some of them we don't use today at all because we have better techniques. You're not going to find uh, freezing in here, uh, but let's see. Uh, probably one of the, the biggies that's right here in the front of this, uh, he's talking about raising pigs and hogs. And then, of course, when you slaughter them for you know meat all of a sudden they have to be preserved today they would be you know it's like you go to you go get fresh pieces of pork at the grocery store um it's cut and it's all perfect and everything's already been done for it you, you don't have that in the 18th century 
So you have to do all the hog preparation here. He probably, he does talk about that. And then he talks about preserving it and he's pickling pork. He's making uh, pickled salt pork. He's uh, pickling it in a brine solution, a salt solution. Um, another thing that shows up here in this section is another important uh, preservation technique, and that would be uh, turning it into sausage. And we don't think about that usually because we just go and buy sausage. But uh, you've, somebody's got to make it. And in this setting, in, the, in this farm setting, they're making their own sausage. And he talks about three or four different kinds of ways to make sausage. And he talks about, yes, smoking, um, like things like bacon and that. So uh, smoking and, and um, salting are both, you know, very, very important techniques. They need to have these um, these cuts of meat available to them for almost the entire rest of the year. Uh, so, I mean, they can they can continue to slaughter later on in the year, but really this time, the late fall, even early winter, is generally when all of this um, butchering is taking place. So we've got um, salting and smoking and sausages, right? Uh, let's see, there's a section he's talking about um, sausages and here's a whole section where he's talking about smoking things, usually in the context of the other techniques. It's generally not like smoking all by itself, but smoking um, added in with these other techniques. Um, I found a couple that I thought were very interesting that kind of jumped out of this book. Um, here's one where he's preserving cherries. He says, um, we, put, we put either of these uh, cherries or slows. I'm not sure what slows are in the time period. I haven't run into that a whole lot. I haven't looked that one up, but it's probably something cherry-like. Um, we put these in a stone bottle. So he means a ceramic uh, bottle. I don't have a, there's a bunch on the shelf back there. Um, we put these in a stone bottle uh, that holds one, two, or three gallons, so it's big, uh, with some sugar, cork it up well, bind leather over it, and we put it in a hole in the ground and cover it up so that no weather can hurt it. In the springtime, we take it up and the liquor will be like claret. So he's uh, preserving these items and he's burying them in the ground. He wants to have, they, he wants them to have a very, very consistent temperature. You know, that kind of low 50s, um, upper 40s that you get when you bury things in the ground. And he's sort of accidentally making a wine here when he talks about it being, maybe he's just referring to it being uh, a particular color. I'm not sure exactly. We'd have to try it out, wouldn't we? Um, and who knows what it would turn out like. Um, preserving gooseberries, strawberries, and um, damsons for tarts or pies. And this one I thought was really interesting because generally canning is not something that they're doing. You really they kind of invent canning uh, in the 19th century. But there are roots here. Uh, for this purpose, the fruit must not be ripe yet arrive to its full or yet arrived to its full growth. Have ready court glass bottles, court glass bottles that are thoroughly dry, and when the fruit are well picked, put either of them into the bottles. Let their corks be of the best velvet sort, uh, that they may keep water from entering. Um, for the next must be put into a kettle of water, or they must be, the bottles must be put into a kettle of water up to their necks, but not to touch the corks. And then when the water is hot enough and the gooseberries look white, take it off the kettle. So he didn't even talk about um, kind of heating them up, but they're basically uh, hot water bath canning here. Uh, when the water's hot enough, take it off the kettle, let the bottles remain till cool and then take them out, tie leather about them, or put wax or pitch on them to keep them uh, dry in a dry place for use. So he's doing a, a canning technique. Now it's not, they're not able to get a, um, like an air seal on this, but they're trying their best to get that. And so they're heating that all up, killing off uh, all the bugs in that so it isn't going to, you know, go bad. It doesn't have bacteria or whatever in it. And then, you know, sealing it up. 
So I, that was that was um, a, a great one. And they have just typical, you know, making jellies and jams, of course. Um, there's drying. I don't think too much about drying. Uh, preserving broad beans or peas dry. And then there's this great little one. It just doesn't take very long at all. It says to preserve mushrooms dry, string them on a thread and hang them over the oven or other dry places to keep them ready for use. So um, drying and, and people were asking about, um, I think it was the, the latest episode that we did in the German kitchen. And we had these guys hanging up uh, on the kind of above my head there on the wall and they're dried orange slices. I mean, we, we do these uh, sometimes just for interesting decoration and color things, but um, they are, it's also a preservation technique uh, that you can use for fruits. It's kind of a, you know, you can soak these and kind of rehydrate them to a certain extent. And obviously with something like, um, you know, the, the you, you see that a little bit with, uh, they talk about doing something similar with lemons that they did here with the mushrooms. A lot of pickling, a lot of pickling. Um, Powell's complete book of cookery has a giant section. There's a bunch of pe pickling over here too. Um, but it's got m lots of uh, pickles. Let's see, that's uh, jellies, candying. That's another one where you, um, like we candied the lime peel. Uh, so they're candying a whole bunch of things, preserving cherries and liquid. Do you remember the episode where we took the cherries and we put them in the brandy with, with sugar? Ooh. 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 Was that cherry bounce? No, it was no? a different one. Well, cherry bounce is oh, very similar. I remember but, that now. Yeah, but yeah, way yeah. back when, when we did the cherries. Uh, okay, here we go. Rules for pickling. And then they pickle cucumbers, duh, right? So um, cucumbers, cucumbers, pickling oysters, pickling melons, pickling French beans, pickling mushrooms, walnuts. This one I thought was weird, pickled lettuce. Okay, pickling lettuce. Uh, onions, we've done that. Pickling cauliflower, pickling red cabbage. Wait a minute, remember that episode we yep. did where we pickled red cabbage? Yep. I still have it. No. -uh. Yeah. Yeah. Don't right do here. it. It's right there. You want to see it? Yeah. Ugh. Ugh. Sometimes I don't clean out the kitchen right often. What does that smell like? Uh. Well, now it smells like. I'll bet it's still edible. Don't do it. Don't do <laughs> it. <laughs> I, I don't know how many years it's been. Uh, five. Yeah. We'll pack it back down. Yeah, we'll come it. back yeah. to it in a few years and see if it's still good. It doesn't, it doesn't have anything fuzzy growing on it. <laughs> and it smells like you could eat it. Yeah. It's, this stream would end early. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to give me some questions, Aaron, I'm going to stop for a little while. Uh, not a ton of questions, Ooh. but I, I do have one, though. Um. When buried in the ground, that form of preserving, mm -hmm. can it freeze if it was left out all winter? So the whole idea here is to bury it in the ground so it doesn't freeze. Generally, uh, at least around here, and who knows uh, exactly what it would be like where they're at. Um, probably a little less problem. Here, we can get our frost, our true frost line that it's like your foundation definitely has to go down to four feet. It probably never frosts below three here, so uh, or freezes below three, and even then, that's pretty darn rare. You got to have a very cold winter for a, a long time for the frost, the you know, the freezing effect to get down below that. So the idea here is that we're going to get it down below that frost line, and it's going to stay at that almost refrigerator temperature uh, for basically indefinitely, even in the summer, in the winter. Um, that's that's what we're, do we're doing when we get way down below ground. And a cellar is going to be like that, but not quite as good. When we seal it up in the ground, it's definitely not got those air flows where it could get a little too cold that a cellar might do. If you had a root cellar or a cellar under the house, it might get too warm or too cool. But if we really kind of seal it into the ground, then it's going to stay at the right temperature. Okay, let's do some uh, super chat real yeah. quick. Yeah. Thanks to everyone who has donated. We appreciate it. Uh, first off, uh, Heather Tory, welcome to the Nutmeg Tavern members. Thank you for that. For anyone uh, interested, that's our YouTube membership. Basically, 
you join, you get emojis, you get a badge by your name. It shows up in the chat. It's just another way to support us. That's and it's uh, kind of fun. Um, Noctilus Am Amator says, "I have a fever, and the only prescription is more nutmeg." No, oh, yes. Yep. Mike Howell, thank you. It's my birthday today, and I can't think of a better better way to kick off the afternoon than watching Townsend's. Thanks for all the joy and amazing content. It's our pleasure, and happy birthday. Yeah. Kyle Wayne 3. Hey guys, I can't wait to see your video on Firing Bricks. Keep up the great work. Yep, very soon. Tyson Q is a lemon guy blowing a kiss, I think. Thank you. <laughs> Harshman Hills, my usual coin for the bartender. Smash that like, everyone. I guess I'll take the bartender money. Today, there you go. Since there you go. <laughs> uh, Matt, no, Matt, no name. Uh, bought my first reenactment gear from Townsend's around 1998. Glad you guys are still doing so well. Thank you. Oh, yeah. It is pretty awesome. Yeah. Still, still around. Yeah. Uh, Max are cool. Thank you. Hey, Max. Are Any cool. recipes for people doing a confit, cooking meat, packing in containers, and then filling all the spaces between with rendered fat to keep it good? Hmm. Uh, Denise Maloney Pyrin or Pyrin, thank you. Um, you can put the dried orange slices in your apple cider with cloves and simmer it. A little Madeira wine oh. too. Yum. Ooh, that sounds good. Yeah. Uh, Robert Wilson, Mr. Townsend's, I know your focus is on historical accuracy, but I was wondering if the coffin dough can be made with modern substitute flour like almond or cricket flour. And then Amber Crystal Daughter has a donation, but no comment. At least I don't think there's a comment. Thank you. Um, yeah, that's all I got for right now. Thanks, everyone. Uh, good question about the flower issue. Um, and I don't, I doubt it. I don't know what it would do. That is definitely an experience uh, experiment when you would have to do. But I think that we really need that gluten um, in the wheat flour to let it lock up and become hard like we need it to. Now, there is probably some great modern substitute that I don't know about because I don't study, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, so maybe someone in the chat section will be able to help you out with that uh, because um, I just don't know what kind of flowers are going to give you that kind of strength. Um, you know, the, the inexpensive ones in the time period would be something like rye. And I don't know that rye has gluten, so maybe it's not the issue of gluten. But, I mean, what do I know about what's going on inside <laughs> that? Uh, uh, I did want to mention really quick, because I usually at about this time in the live stream, I talk about the new Patreon people. And unfortunately, with what was going on with this week, my schedule is completely blown away and even earlier today we were shooting video so I wasn't able to do all the prep I needed to do so unfortunately I don't have the new Patreon list but I will get it next week it'll be extra long but it'll be <laughs> wonderful so I definitely want to thank all you Patreon folks out there um, for what you do making making what we do happen so let me dig back into uh, a couple of these a couple more interesting um, interesting ones. And, oh, I'm not going to read that one because I think that's going to be a uh, next cooking episode. And I don't want to give everything <laughs> away. Um, but they're always fun and interesting to read. Um, another one that we don't think about often as a preservation technique, but it so is, and that is cheese making. Um, very important because... Um, if you can't get rid of milk and when, you know, your cows are giving milk, you can't stop them. You know, no, they, it's like, here comes the milk. You <laughs> better find someone to drink it or even better preserve it for when the cows are dry and you still want to have a, something, you know, like that. Uh, and cheese is the thing that you are going to be doing. So there are lots of cheese uh, recipes in the time period and a farmer like William Ellis uh, that's going to be one of the things that's happening in the household. And notice here that um, you know, this is uh, this is for the housewife. And there's a, a lot of duties here in this book that we would say, um, even for a, a farmer's wife, seem to be outside of their 
you know, their what we think of as the, the things that they're going to be doing, their their uh, roles in, within the household. There's a lot of complete farm management that's going on here that he knows that the housewife is going to be doing or having a, a good deal of the hand in. Uh, let's see, what else is in here? Yeah, pickling oysters. I don't know. You know, I just, I just don't know about pickling oysters. Um, <laughs> and what's another thing uh, that is a preservation technique that we just don't click with? And they're usually, almost in every one of these 18th century cookbooks, great large sections about making wine. Again, very important preservation technique. All this fruit is coming in. How do we preserve that fruit? Well, we can preserve it with a whole bunch of sugar, uh, which is pretty expensive to make those jellies and jams because usually something like a, a jelly is going to be 50-50 fruit to sugar. That's getting very expensive in the day when sugar is, you know, costs a lot of money. Um, so wine is something that extracts the sugars that are already in the fruit and turns that into alcohol and preserves the, uh, the item that we're trying to preserve. Um, same thing goes for, uh, in this case, beer is another preservation technique. Uh, what are we going to do with um, things like, you know, the grains that we would turn into malts? And especially, uh, and we did the episode on peach, was it peach brandy or apple brandy? It was apple brandy. Um, the brandies where we make a wine and then we distill it even further again that is a way to at least preserve if not the flavor or the nutrition the money that is going to be you know from crops that you couldn't sell otherwise you get this problem william ellis has this problem of well our apple trees are extremely prolific more apples than we can eat before they go bad so what do we do with them and he makes cider with them or he uses them in other other ways um, but cider is one of those you know you you've got to have uh you've got to be making cider with all this excess of apples and apples are one of those things it seems like um apples either it's either it's a great apple year or it's a lousy apple year and one is a great one. Your, your trees are loaded. They're, you know, the branches are falling off because they just can't uh, handle it. Um, and what else are we going to pickle? Right? We're thinking pickle. When we think pickles, we think, you know, well, we can pickle cucumbers. We can pickle asparagus, um, onions. That, you know, that isn't uh, too strange. But then we get to things like, uh, pickling, uh, well, pickled beets, uh, pickled turnips. I don't think I've heard of pickling uh, turnips. Pickling currants, and this is, some of these uh, are pickling fruits, which is not something we do very often. Pickling grapes? Yeah, it's pickling grapes. Is, um, and then we get into pickled pigeons, pickled tongues, so like cow's tongues. Uh, pickled pork we've talked about before, and pickling salmon. Uh, take two quarts of good vinegar, half an ounce of Jamaica pepper, that's allspice, cloves and mace of each, a quarter of an ounce, near a pound of salt, bruise the spice grossly, so not too finely. Uh, put all of these to a small quantity of water, put just enough to cover your fish, Cut your fish around in three or four pieces according to the size of the salmon. And when the liquor boils up in your fish, oh boy, sometimes these can be really hard to figure out. Boil it well and then take the fish out of the pickle. Let it cool. <laughs> Throw it out. No, that's not what it says. Uh, when it is cold, put your fingers into the barrel or stein where you intend to keep it. Okay. Um... Strewing in some spice and bay leaves between each piece of fish. Let the pickle cool and then scum off the fat. And when the pickle is quite cold, pour it on your fish and then cover it close. So pickled salmon, pickled tench, pickled lobsters. Pickled lobsters? I don't think we would do that today, pickling lobsters. Um, 
pickled smelts. Remember that one? Oh, yeah. Yeah, pickled smelts. That That's one, good stuff. I don't know if I <laughs> almost didn't survive that one. Probably almost as bad. That's what's going on right here. Verjuice. And this is uh, usually verjuice is uh, made with grapes. This is a verjuice made with crab apples. Again, well, you know, we're going to use those, and it's a way to you know use up something like crab apples that we're not quite sure what to do with. Distilling verjuice for pickles and making vinegar. This this vinegar is really not quite as much of a we we use vinegar for uh, preservation technique. And here he talks about making the vinegar with basically sugar and water and yeast and kind of brewing up your own beer and then, well, then letting it turn into vinegar. Mm. Got a couple questions yeah. and donations if you're down with that. Yeah. Um, butter should be able to age too, right? Smoking it? I don't know about smoking. What you do with butter is you salt it. We, we, um, we you will go to the grocery store. Normally, we have two choices. We have unsalted butter and salted butter. And if you've ever had the two side by side, like out on your counter, it's like, well, you know, we'll just, we'll let it get soft in the summertime so that we can spread it on things. And boy, you know, unsalted butter can go off really quickly. Uh, salted butter lasts longer. But when they made salted butter, they put a lot of salt in their butter and they would actually have to wash the salt out of it to make it edible, but that's how you're going to preserve your butter. Mm -hmm. um, what form of preserving is a, a pemmican? Is it drying or chemistry going on there? Well, it's um, it's a it's a combination, and that reminded me of the answer or the question that I forgot to answer in the last batch, and I'll try to remember it again because it just flew out of my head. Uh, pemmican is twofold. You're drying the, the meat, and then you are protecting it from the air by giving it the, the suet. And it's also in a leather bag of uh, sometimes. So it's like a two or three fold preservation technique, and that's why it can last so long. We've taken out all the moisture out of the meat by drying it. It's, it's usually smoked at the same time. So we're drying it, we're smoking it, we're smothering it in fat so it can't get any air, and then we're putting it in a leather bag. It isn't any wonder that it can add, that it can last 10, 20, 30 years. Um, were vinegar or sour wines also used in first aid at the time? I definitely, uh, they're definitely using them for a, not that they would call it this, well, maybe they would, uh, a disinfection method. So they would, you know, wash hmm. things down, um, whole areas down that they thought was, you know, in, infectious. They had some of these concepts like, well, there's, this is, you know, this is bad. This area is bad. There's something wrong. People get sick when they deal with it all the time. And so we're going to wash it with vinegar. Now, have they had this idea about doing it on people? Uh, right this second, I don't have it in my head. Um, because it's been a while since I've been in some of the medical books, although even these books have medicine in them, uh, I could probably come up with a quick reference. My guess is yes, 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 uh, but I don't have one on the top of my head. Mm -hmm. um, we got some donations to get to. And again, thanks everyone for all the, all the support. Yeah. Okay, where do we leave off? Um, Casey Wolf, thank you. I'm currently brewing some pumpkin ale, wondering if you've ever heard mention of other non-grain crops being preserved by means of being incorporated into ale in the period. Uh, Andre Fien, I believe. Um, welcome to the membership. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Amber, Amber Crystal Daughter again. Yes. Um, Mark Kurlansky has an excellent book on the history of salt in the world called Salt. Yeah, Big I got it. You got that one? Yeah. There you go. Big thumbs up on this one. Lots of preservation and economics. Mike Crook, thank you. Um, 18th century recipes make so much food. Did they reheat things in the ovens to eat later? Eat in a cold, eat cold or at room temperature or preserve? Um, Florida 32 ounce. How common was the oven you just built in the everyday home? And did the homeowner build it from shared blueprints or were there contractors who did it for the homeowners for money? That's a, that's a cool question. 
Yeah, unfortunately, I haven't had a piece of paper to write these down, Aaron. So you you okay. I mean, you have to go back through them for me. Well, I'll go through them and then we'll and then we'll hit them hit them okay. again. Uh, Speed and style, Tony. Mm -hmm. Thank you. What were the different brines used for pickling? Sweet, bitter, vinegar? All question marks. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Salome Perry. Thank you. And Rol Rol Rolando Hernandez. Could you seal foods in fats that solidify at colder temperatures? Okay, mm -hmm. so let me go back and get those <laughs> those other ones. Uh, Heard mention of other non-grain crops being preserved by means of being incorporated into ale, a pumpkin ale. Yeah, so I mean, you're gonna you're you are going to use some other things. I uh, definitely some other grains and you know, like corn beer comes up, although that's one of those flavors that beer people try to not get is that creamed corn kind of taste. But um, so there's uh, things like maize corn. Um, and there's also some fruits that they sometimes call beer. But it, I mean, it seems to me like it's really coming out more like a wine. I mean, those two things can be uh, a little complex to separate because in one sense, they're really the same thing. Um, so, um, but other than that, I'm sure it's there, but it's a little trickier to, to find. The cookbooks don't talk about that. And the brewers are kind of sticking with particular things, um, because that's their expertise and it's, uh, and they're, they're not going to use all these strange ingredients. Um, but there are other situations where those those kinds of things might come up, uh, where there's an individual household or you know a large farm, and they're doing their own beer, and they they get to experiment because they they want to. It's just for them, right? So it could be hard for that to be a commercial thing in the time period. And most, I don't know if most, but I would say most of the brewing is going on in a in a commercial sense. Although there's a lot of home brewing. Um, going on. Um, oh, reheating things yes, or like yes. leftovers. So uh, reheating things, definitely. You, they were doing that. I'll, although a lot of times things were made specifically. So I talked about that in the coffin episode where um, things are being brought. They're going to cook these in a very large pastry shell. And that shell is meant to be used as a as a cover, not eaten necessarily. Uh, it, you know, it might be eaten toward the end or given to the hogs or whatever. Um, but it's not meant to kind of be served with a thing like we think of as pies. It's it's the box that it gets cooked in and stored in and then gotten rid of because it can be a different size shape all the time, and you don't want to tie up your really expensive cookware as this storage container. Uh, so those things generally were, um, many times, were a cold served item that could be served over and over again. Uh, but I, I think um, the idea that some things would get either reheated or tossed into the stew pot and stirred in with the next thing uh, is, is a quite a common thing. Although they don't necessarily always reference it in something like a cookbook because that's not really cooking, that's more like just uh, alternative serving techniques and they don't tend to talk about that as much. Um, the other one was, we did the, did we do the fats that solidify at a colder temperature, sealing foods with that, did we get that? Right, now I haven't talked about that yet, but yeah, there's a lot of that going on. They do some of that right here in some of these cookbooks. Uh, where they talk about you know pouring a, a liquid fat on, and uh, you can see that going on definitely in the the potting techniques. I hadn't talked about potting yet. Thank you for bringing that one up. Uh, we did a potted beef episode, and uh, we've got I think a potting episode coming up. But I still have to make the pot. Um, but that's de definitely that sort of pseudo canning technique where you cook these things up and then you pour the liquid fats on top that solidify. And the biggie there, the one that works really well is suet, which is what you're using in pemmican. And that is not muscle fat. Suet really gets, it's like a wax. Um, so it can work really well and it's still edible if 
a little strange. Uh, we're not used to that, that um, you know, like eating beeswax today. It's got a, a different texture that we might kind of, kind of think is yucky, but um, they were, you know, well versed in that. So yes, that's a very common technique. Um, did we get the one about? I've got Brian here. Oven building. Oven, oven yes. Like blueprints or yes. contracting that out. Uh, there's, I, I don't know about ovens per se, uh, especially an earthen oven that, uh, like we've made. So brick ovens, yeah, that's a mason's job that's, that's going to make a brick oven. And we see a lot of, you know, brick ovens in this time period. You'll see them in paintings and in existing uh, kitchens and fireplaces, uh, all these brick ovens. And that's, you know, part of the mason's job. Um, to be good at building the oven into your fireplace. Um, so I don't know about plans. I think most of the time in the time period, those most of those plans are sort of like right here. The you know the mace like well oh this is one of those seven brick ones. We just go like this and da da da. Um, you know I think a lot of that is had to work and they don't need to have plans. And the and an earthen oven is very sort of hands on. Make it how you need it kind of, you know, I'll make it myself kind of situation. And they were, um, there's some interesting reading about the making of um, those huge masonry heaters that they use in Northern Europe and in other places. And sometimes that's almost a, a cooking thing. It's a heating thing. It's, a, you know, it's used for a lot of different purposes. And they even talk about the idea that the person who would come in and build that thing, they might not... Like they'd have a special little part that wasn't built quite right, you know, like a little brick that stuck out, and they knew it would make it not work well, and and then they would, uh, the 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 owner would have to come back and say, oh, I'll, I'll give you extra money to make it work right, you know, and the person just sort of reach in there and, you know, oh, there you go, it's all fixed now, thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> so there's some stories like that about. Um, people that specialized in making uh, those kinds of tools. Let's hope that wasn't too often. <laughs> what uh, there about? Was, oh, good. There was the question about the brine, right? Uh, um, yeah. Right, so sweet, bitter, vinegar. So we're definitely doing uh, both a vinegar kind of brine thing, but brine really says just salt. And they did just straight up uh, salt baths, basically. And they talk over and over about this idea of getting it uh, salty enough that it will float an egg. And that's where they're shooting for this uh, particular um, amount of salt in solution so that it will do the proper job. And that easy to, easy to do test, which they didn't have any other way. It's kind of like a real primitive hygrometer. Uh, and that is drop that egg in there and and when that egg starts to float, well, then we know. Hopefully, it's like a fresh egg because a bad uh, old egg will float naturally and you can get it wrong. Um, what about gourd preservation, like for making containers? and? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I'm stick, sticking here basically with um, food uh, preservation. I'm not sure exactly what where I would find the gourd items it's going to be in a whole different kind of a book mm -hmm. and there's not as much sort of how to uh, in that as there are food everybody wants to know how to food um but you know what where are you going to find the information on you know how to preserve a gourd or something? Mm -hmm. uh i got a couple more donations um ch -ch 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 -ch. nikki Coker, thank you so much. Yes. Um, it's a it's a dude riding around on a rocket. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, Denise Maloney Pirin, thank you again. Did I miss the pig naming poll? I didn't check during the week. No, we haven't done it yet. The week got away from us for sure. Oh, um, this week. Yeah. Uh, Amber Crystal Daughter, thank you for hair raising. For hair raising contrast with food preservation and safety, read any good source on Victorian food handling. Yikes mm. to the 10th power. <laughs> uh, John Talley, thank you. What were smokehouses like in the 18th century? How long could meat be preserved using them? Ever thought about building one on the homestead? That would be great. And then Taco Lover says, I will work for Grog. <laughs> <laughs> uh 
Yeah, so uh, Smokehouse, you know, I can't answer some of those questions um, exactly because I don't know, you know, in the time period necessarily what they would expect or what they would expect and what's actually safe, right? And I don't, I don't want to give people advice. It's like, well, in the 18th century, they said it would work for 16 months, you know, and you do that and people are killing over all over the place. Uh, so, you know, that's not the kind of uh, how to advice I necessarily want to give. Um, but we have talked uh, several different times about the idea of a smokehouse on the homestead. And it is, um, it's pretty high-ish in the list, but it's definitely going to be a kind of a next year project because yeah. winter is coming. Yeah. Um, let me see. What do, what do I got here for uh, questions? Well, someone was saying with like the gourd thing we were just talking about, they yeah. usually um, just dry out, Yeah. I guess. And then there you go. That's kind of... Right. I don't know how long term that would be having like a bowl well, or something. Once it dries out, it's going to last a long time unless you get it too so wet that it uh, right. goes bad. Right. Um... S. Mackey, thank you for the donation. Um, doo, doo, doo. Yeah, I'm not seeing a ton of okay, questions. Okay, so there. yeah, I'll let you. Here we do go. Your thing. I remember. I remember the egg uh, preservation episode. Yep. So oh, yeah. we did the. Was it top six? Top. Yep. Top six. Top six yep. egg preservation methods. Yeah. One of the ones I thought was strangest to me was the burying eggs in ashes. Yes. Yeah. To preserve nectarines, peaches, and apricots, wood ashes finely sifted uh, are of a soft, dry nature and so impregnated with vegetable salts that they are enemies to insects and potentially resist putrefaction. Mm. <laughs> Therefore, <laughs> lay, uh, have a layer of such ashes at the bottom of a wooden or tin box, place your fruit on it, at one inch distance from each other, then sift ashes over them all two inches thick. This done, lay more fruit in the same manner and pre uh, proceed on. Ashes and fruit till the box is full. Thus laid, the ashes and box will keep out the air. So they knew that just having access to air was going to be a bad thing. Preserve the fruit. Uh, it will preserve the fruit fresh and sound some time. Let's see. Uh, B, the uh, nectarines, peaches, apricots, plums, or other seeds also of a kind may be preserved. And if occasion be, they may be safely carried a hundred miles unhurt. Or instead of ashes, you may use some dried sand. Doesn't that sound slightly better? I don't know. Or think the wood ashes best for keeping any stone fruit in order till, uh, in order till towards Whitsuntide, which I am not sure about when exactly Whitsuntide is. So yeah, uh, burying things in ashes. We don't do that today, do we? In fact, most people don't have a giant pile of ashes, but ashes are um, both a resource. I mean, we think when we think of ashes today, we think, you know, oh, how do I get rid of these ashes? What do I do? Um, they're thinking, oh, wait, save those ashes. Um, I'm going to preserve something in them, or I'm going to use them for uh, making lye. I mean, everything, things we would think were just horrible garbage, are, uh, are turning out to be very useful for them. They're storing them, they're keeping them, they're using them for preserving. So it's just crazy when you look in these cookbooks and you think about all the different ways. It was so important to store this food and they had to come up with just, you know, 10, a dozen different ways and try all these out. And some are going to work for a short period of time or a long period of time. Um, yeah. And, and also the idea of an item being preserved, uh, the, let's say the variety. He talks about apples and some apples stay good for a long time. Some of them you have to use right away. And he's talking about storing apples in different sorts of ways. And if we think about it today, the varieties of apples we have, and in fact, the varieties of a lot of fruits and vegetables we have, have been tweaked solely for the idea that it can be transported a long period, you know, a long distance. They didn't have that issue, but they did have that 
well, I want a variety that can keep for a long time in storage. So it's definitely an issue for them. Um, Redondo Rita just joined the Nutmeg Tavern members. Thank you and welcome. Um, Colton Elliott, thank you. And then Keltoid5 with a nice donation. Says, thank you. I'm at work. Shh, don't tell me. <laughs> All right, we won't. Um, someone was asking about other uses for wood ash mm -hmm. besides preservation. Well, I mentioned uh, the lye, right? Uh, so you you um, you can make lye soap and, and these things with uh, wood ashes. But wood ashes become an extremely important export item, if you can believe it, in North America in the 18th century. And what they do is, of course, what happens is, is here in North America, um, we've got trees upon trees upon trees. It's like the land of trees when they come here in the 18th century. What do we do? We got to get rid of these trees so that we can farm the ground. Um, but the trees are in your way and they're very difficult to deal with. Um, you know, you saw them down and then you have this giant tree in your way. Uh, so you can only build so much with it. In fact, most of the time you can't build anything with a giant tree. It's so huge, you can't even haul it around. The only thing you can do with your giant tree that's in your way is to burn it. And you burn it till it's ashes. And then you think, wait a minute, I'm not gonna waste those ashes. I'm going to boil them down and I'm not gonna turn them into lye, but I'm gonna turn them into pot ash, which is something that you can export and sell. And so, in North America, we were exporting and selling potash. Um, it, it was an ex it was a very uh, desired and sought after um, industrial chemical in uh, not only here but in Europe. And they didn't have as many trees, so potash could be expensive over there. And there were like potash was coming in from Germ or from uh, like Russia, but it was yucky black potash. For some reason, they didn't. I don't know how they were processing it, but it, it wasn't as useful, and our potash was great. And we would even make potassium carbonate with it, which turns into pearl ash, which is further processing it, and that starts to be used as a leavening agent that we now use sodium bicarbonate. They were using potassium carbonate, doing the same kind of thing making a chemically leavened product in the late 18th century, 19th century. Uh, David Parker says, another fine show. Thanks again. Thank you. That was a donation. And then uh, Lena Tong has joined the Nutmeg Taverns. Thank you. Membership. Thank you for joining. Um, is there another way of preserving milk other than turning it into, in, it into cheese? Uh, other than the short-term method that's coming to mind, there probably is, there probably is a dozen ways and uh, it's just you know, um, not necessarily talked about in some of these. Uh, but they would do straight up refrigeration, right? Except, of course, it's not done the way we would do refrigeration, but they had spring houses. Um, where they, there was a spring and they would put their milk in that to preserve it for shorter periods of time. Um, they also would put it in bottles and, and t tie a rope on it and lower it into the well to keep it cool. Uh, so there's short-term preservation techniques like that, which are just straight up, you know, hey, put it in the fridge. What is the oldest known type of vinegar in North America? What is this? Some kind of, <laughs> is it, I, I don't know what to tell you about uh the oldest vinegar type? A really good question. <laughs> um, do some digging for for some questions. Um, Let me tell you yeah. about, uh, so last week's, uh, or this Monday's episode, if you didn't check it out, uh, the coffin episode, you might not have recognized the, the thumb because it's a little different than what we normally do. Um, but the coffin episode is, even though it's, I mean, in one sense, it's kind of a joke because we made the coffins in the shape of a coffin. It's kind of Halloween special. It's also a very important, even preservation technique. This idea of a standing crust pie, you know, I talked about like um, making these, these giant crusts. Uh, I talk about making this um, crust method and it is definitely a shortish term um, but a, a preservation technique and they would they would make they would make this pie crust it's not really meant to be yummy yummy eaten um, but it's there to be this 
uh, preservation container. Next week, uh, Monday, we're actually doing a, uh, a recipe out of this one, and it should be uh, should be a lot of fun, really interesting, seasonal. Um, we're doing something that's super simple. You know, one of the things I thought about as I was I was I was digging into this um, uh, um, recipe for Monday's episode was the idea that we get kind of stuck in the idea that food has to be it has to be beautiful, it has to be complicated. Uh, we you can do it wrong, right? But food is is for us. We get to do whatever we want with our food. We should be we should feel free to do simple food. And this recipe is that. It's, it's doing something a little simpler than we would expect it. Um, but it still is, is, number one, very, very easy. Um, very simple. We should not be intimidated. We should do it. It's just, you know, kids should be able to do it, whatever that is. And still very, very good. Don't be intimidated by food. Jump in and do it. Yep. So we're getting ready to wrap up yeah i'd like to see if we could get to a thousand likes again yeah we've been doing to every getting there every week that's been pretty awesome yeah that's so great. um before we go um duncan fetty became a new member thank you so much thank you and aaron howitt has a donation mm -hmm. and says a lot of historical preservation was we don't know why this works but it does yeah. case in point fermentation <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah, um, yeah. I, that and that's an important thing i mean Maybe not. people had secrets, right? In the 18th century, they would know how to do things. They definitely, a lot of times, either they they thought they knew why it worked, and they were wrong, wrong, wrong. <laughs> Brewing is one of those where you're like, boy, did you guys get this wrong? You know, they saw, look, all these bubbles are coming up, and it's like, oh, it must be because uh, the the heat from the fire is being infused into the, you know, bubbles are being infused. For, well, you guys are crazy. That's not what's going on there. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's really interesting. The amazing things they were able to do without having actual knowledge about the underlying reason why it was working. Yeah, I... And almost every one of these preservation techniques, I'm sure nobody really knew. I mean, there was this, oh, we want to keep air from getting uh, to it. or But they didn't really have an idea about why things were going bad in the first place, much less why their preservation technique kept it from going bad. Mm -hmm. It has been a wonderful time here in the Nutmeg Tavern. I am glad you have been able to come in, relax, have fun, uh, chat in that chat section. And, you know, it's going to be a great week next week. Real quick. Yes. I just got a donation with a question. Yeah. Um, did they preserve water such as distilled water? Because that's a whole thing of water being dirty. Well, yes, uh, water was dirty. And if they're going to preserve it in any way, they're probably going to add something like alcohol to it, a brandy, uh, something similar. And water preservation was difficult so instead of preserving water uh, they would take a different liquid with them so beer is a big substitute uh, for something like water so that's a shipboard issue it's like well you know what our water has all gone bad uh, they would have barrels and barrels and barrels of water um, on their ship because of course salt water is not going to do anybody any good and that water would go bad and they would run low on water you've got to have water um, so sometimes beer was the kind of substitute. It didn't substitute everything. You still had to have water, but you could use less of it if you had something, or at least they thought. <laughs> That's how it worked. I don't know whether beer is a good substitute for water. I'm not going to answer that question. <laughs> I think that's all we got. Have a tremendous weekend. I want to thank you for coming on in uh, supporting us both as sort of, sort of a moral support and encouragement, yep. which is so important to be able to do what we do. Uh, you know, day in, day out, the creative energy it takes to dig in these things and make videos, it can't be done by us alone. We need people supporting us and helping us. You are doing it. You're sharing our videos. You're watching the videos. You are supporting us monetarily sometimes, whether it's in uh, Super Chat or Patreon uh, membership going to the merch channel when we've got neat mugs available, whatever it is, 
You guys make what we do completely possible. Thank you so much. And again, have a tremendous weekend. Thanks for watching.